excited you're here. And turn to another neighbor and say, it's about to get gooder. Sometimes I like to start off with some proper English uh, while I'm trying to get my iPad to be my friend. Here we go. Look at that. Well, I, I know there's a few people missing because of the Seahawks game, and uh, I'm torn on that one because uh, I, I love the Seahawks, but I love my church more, And uh, but I am praying for the Seahawks to have an amazing win today. You know, uh, they're playing uh, Baltimore, and uh, it's interesting, They uh, the Baltimore police have actually figured out how to fix some of their uh, speeding and traffic problems recently. I was just reading up on this today. And what they've done is when they pull someone over, they, they threaten to give them Ravens tickets. And if they pull you over a second time, they enforce that you have to go to one of the games. So it's been working wonders. And uh, we're just believing that today the Seahawks are going to do awesome. Any Hawks fans in the house and all the cheeseheads said, Got way too many cheese heads in this room. Can I just say that? We've got, uh, it's good times. You won. Yes. Victory in Jesus. Come on. We're going to uh, open up our Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 22. And I'm going to just uh, expound for a little bit from this passage today. And, you know, last week we had uh, Pastor Reese here, a good friend of mine, and hope you guys enjoyed that. I, I love that. I listened online, was there for a little bit. You guys enjoy last week? Come on, we're, we're blessed to have, and, and everyone else, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, if you weren't here, go check it out online on our Facebook page. It's there. It's good stuff. But God's doing uh, great things, I believe, in our city, and he's connecting us with a lot of uh, great churches and Matthew chapter uh, 22, I want to pick it up in verse 34, and I'm just going to read this passage here, and um, we're going to start a journey right now, and the, the title of this journey is Love People More, and it's, it's a journey that I feel God's been taking me on for a season and been working something inside my heart as I've been processing some tough questions in my, my own life, my own journey, and, and my own response to the culture around us and trying to figure out, God, how do I, how do I be salt and light? How do I be everything you've called me to do in, in this uh, world that we live in with everything going on? And uh, this passage here in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Sadducees were these um, they were, they were the upper class. In Jesus' time, there was three classes. There was your upper class, which included a lot of your politicians and your, your Sadducees. And the Sadducees were people that kind of typically sided with the Roman government, somewhat progressive, but yet conservative in their, in their values, but progressive in their thinking. They wanted Rome to come and fix everything. And uh, Jesus had just recently silenced them, and it says, then the Pharisees got together. Now, the Pharisees were middle-class people, but they were religious zealots, and they, they held on to the tradition of the, the law and the land and everything pretty solid, and they got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. He said, teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? And Jesus immediately replied, could you imagine being Jesus, like having these people come and they're just, they hit Jesus with questions out of nowhere. And he, he just, he just immediately flows. And he says, look, um, the 10 commandments, what's the most important? Now we think of the 10 commandments, but they would have over 600 commandments that they were referencing as Pharisees that they tried to keep each and every one of them at that time. And it says that Jesus immediately responded with this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. It's interesting that, that Jesus begins to elaborate on this in such, such a deep way here. He says, this is, um, this is the first and greatest commandment. He said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. I love the way the, the message Bible says it this way. It says, Jesus said to them, he said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most and important, the first on any list. Like Jesus was just ready to go with, with this. And he says, there, there's also a second and it's said alongside of it. And it's love others as well as you love yourself. These two commandments are pegs. 
everything in God's law and the prophet hangs from them. Jesus immediately had this response and as I've been studying out this passage, we're going to lay a foundation today. And I'm, I'm telling you, we're, we're going to go on a journey for the next uh, few months, really diving into this idea of what does it mean to love people more? Because it's, it's not just one sermon I can preach. It's not one thought I can give you. It's not just one principle. It's, it's literally a lifestyle, a choice, a perspective that Jesus had. And we're going to, we're going to be looking uh, very thoroughly at his life as we go into this. And I just want to encourage you, and I want to invite you to begin to read the Gospels. If, if you're uh, doing devotions on a regular basis, I want to encourage you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over these next couple months and dive into it. If you haven't read the Gospels before, they're the first four books of the New Testament, and they're a great way to really get to know Jesus. And if you got a, an old school Bible, it'll have red writing every time Jesus is talking. And I'd love for you to really engage with the letters in red and, and just ask some deep questions of how was Jesus addressing the issues of his culture? And can we bow our head? Father, I just ask that you would help us as we go on this journey, God, as we look to this book of dreams, God, the, the written word, the Bible, Lord, it's filled with the answers, God, and it's filled with your love and it's filled with your purpose. So I pray you'd speak to each and every one of us. God, give us a hunger for it through this series. Let us realize, God, that your word, the Bible, has answers to our situations, to our problems, to our challenges, God, and help us as a community. Lord, to grow, to be more Christ-like, more like you, God, and to grow in love and to love people more, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. You know, it's, it's interesting, as, as I look to culture, I feel like the world is asking for some, some real answers. And by the world, I, I don't just mean like the, those that are, that are out there that are far from God. I, I believe the whole world, I believe Christians are, are asking uh, some really tough questions in the, in the time that we live right now of God. Why did that happen? Lord, how did that happen? And, and what should my response be to what's going on? Does anyone feel that when you, when you look around culture, you, you look at news and you, you look at a society that's being polarized and, and, and in almost every fashion, it's that we're getting pushed to one extreme or another. And, and we can begin to have a mentality where we start to take sides um, versus a mentality that says, God, what do you want me to do? Maybe I'm maybe at times I'm supposed to be over here and times over here and sometimes right here in the middle. And I, I just believe as Christians that God wants to take us all on a journey where we don't just simply react to the culture we live around. You know what I, I love about Jesus as I've been studying his life the last three months, I've just been diving into the gospels and reading and reading and just soaking this in is that Jesus, Jesus was not one to react to what the devil was doing. Jesus, when, when the enemy came and said, do this, Jesus didn't react to him. He actually responded to him with insight from the Father. And can I submit a thought to us as a church that when we allow ourselves to be just reactionary people, we actually allow the enemy to set the narrative in our life. We allow the enemy to direct our focus but when we become followers of Jesus, just like he was, the Bible, we're going to look at this today, we begin to get focused on calling and we begin to set the narrative. And I believe that God's called us to set the narrative in our city. Can I hear an amen? God's called us to have an impact on Austin. God's called us to reach into all these different areas. And as our church continues to grow and as we continue to take ground, as we continue to just walk out this journey, I believe that, that God's going to give us influence as we grow little by little. And he's going to allow us to have impact, but we're not going to get that impact by, by doing just the next great thing as a church, we're going to get that impact by saying, Father, what do you want us to do? As Dreamers Church, what do you want us to do? Like, what have you called us to do? What's, what's our part in this city? What is it that the doors that you're opening, what is the doors that God's opening for each one of you right where you're at? 
And I believe as each person in this room gets a word from God and takes steps, there's going to be multiplied influence. And I believe that we will have a response to what's going on in culture. I believe we will have a response to the pain of the people around us. But but it's not going to be a reaction to the enemy, but rather it's going to be a response to what we receive from our Father. And so... In this, in this series of Love People More, we're going to really analyze the life of Jesus. And we're going to take a look at his response. Today, I'm just going to lay a foundation for this, this thought. We're not going to even get into really what it means to love other people more. Because because to love people more first, we have to be madly in love with God. And then the Bible says, not only do you have to love people more, but it's more than who? More than, more than I love my wife, more than I love uh, that thing, or does the Bible say more than I love myself? Which means I've got to fix my self-worth if I'm going to go love people more. Because I believe there are a lot of people that love people more, and it's doing no good because you don't love yourself. You don't, you don't love what God created you to be. You don't love your uniqueness. You don't love your ability. You don't love your calling and placement in, in God's perfect timing. And I believe as we go on this journey, what's going to happen is we're going to get a a radical passion to hear the voice of our Father. I believe as we go on this journey, we're going to really get an understanding of how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that cool that Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 talks about how we're God's uh, handiwork? Like He handcrafted you and I. He made us so intelligent, so specific, so designed to impact change, and yet we we live in a society that's continually teaching us, teaching us that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we don't have the the right abilities. We live in a social media-driven society that we we have more anxiety than we've ever had. Humanity, we have have more people on, on medications and things because of insecurities and all kinds of things that are getting into our spirit. Where are they getting in? They're getting into our mind. We're going to take a look at some of this. And and I believe as we do, we're going to just get to a place where we're whole, we're healthy, we're secure. And I believe God wants to take us to a place where in this church, when you walk in, you go, I'm a child of God. And you know what that means. And I believe that if we can get to a place where we can say, I'm a child of God, and I know what that means, I believe that God's going to start drawing in so many broken people from our city, it's going to blow your mind. But it's not going to blow your mind because we do the right uh, next video, because we do the right preaching series, because we do the right this or that. It's because we're in right standing with our Father, and we know that we're sons and daughters of the King, and we, we know that He's called us and chosen us and designed us. And when a broken person comes in and says, I'm nothing, you're, you're going to look at them and go, no, no, no. You're you're not nothing. You know what the Bible says about you and I? What it says about how God looks at us, how he thinks about us. Well, God doesn't hear, he doesn't hear my pain. You know what the Bible says? God actually collects every tear in a bottle. Like he's so interested in every ounce of your pain. He's such a crazy loving dad. I believe when we get the revelation of who we are, we're just going to see see just an outpouring of just uh, people being touched in such a powerful way. You know, our Bible has the answers. This book, if if, if there's one thing I hope that comes out of of this, this series is that you will fall so in love with this book, the Bible, that you'll say, man, I want to read it. I want to, I want to internalize it. I want to memorize it. I want, I want it in my soul. I want to be like Jeremiah going, man, your word, oh Lord, it is burning in my spirit. You know, you you ever get it like a, for me, like if I get a really good joke, I get excited. Like, when am I going to see my friends? You know, when am I going to see David or when am I going to see Matt? I got, I got this great new joke. I'm going to, and they're going to laugh and I'm going to be awesome. Right. And for, for some of you, it's like, you get a great new recipe and you're like, man, I can't wait to cook this thing. Or some of you, you get a a, a new jacket and you're like, man, I just can't wait to walk in and be like, Oh, these old threads, you know? Right. I mean, we, we all have certain things that we like, but the Bible, the Bible says that when it gets inside of you, it becomes that thing. It becomes that recipe, that new jacket, that, that, that you just, it begins to burn inside of you. 
But you know what? One little spark getting inside of you, you know, a little quick little glance on Facebook and see a scripture and, oh, that's my verse for the day. Driving through and listening to Christian radio and some real soft voice tells you something super holy. Oh, that's my word for this month. Hey, bless your heart with all of that. But if you would get into this book, it's got so much meat in it. You you would be getting up out of bed going, oh my gosh, I ate too much. I'm so full. I can't believe what this book can do in my life. But we have a society of of Christians that don't know how to get fed. They don't know how to eat eat and they're they're looking for a quick little sugary brownie that they could eat and and feel full and healthy but how we get healthy is by reading this book getting it into us and let it start a fire let it start a fire and yes we want some kindling on that fire so i'll listen to some some great worship we have a worship song coming out on tuesday can i please encourage you church Hop on iTunes on Tuesday. Can I can I ask you to do something kind of cool? Hop on. Uh, you can't do it till Tuesday because pre-release they won't let you do it. But once it's released, you can. And could you just think of a few people that you go, you know what? I want to share this song. I want to share this declaration. I want to share this moment with them. And I believe it'll touch them. And just pay 69 cents and gift it to a few people. Uh, all you need is their email or their phone. And you can just gift it right to them. I know on Tuesday I'm going to take some time and just say, Holy Spirit, Show me who to, who to bless today. And I'm going to write them a note that I don't know what you're going through, but I know my God does. And I know that right here, right now, can be a now moment wherever you're sitting, listening to this song. I believe that God can do a miracle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. And I would just encourage you, take a moment on Tuesday and do that. It's such a cool way to, to bless people. But, but worship is kindling. It's, it's not the fire. The fire that we experience in worship really should come out of us having spent time with Jesus, us having spent time in the word. And so I just hope that through this series that that you guys are going to start going, wow, man, whatever pastor's eating, it, it, it's good. Like I want to, I want to go to that restaurant. Let me tell you what the, the restaurant is right here. It's called the red letter restaurant. It's a, it's a red letter month. We're going to, we're going to all hang out at the red letter. All right. Not the red fig, the red letter. And, um, Anyway, I just I just believe that God wants to do something. I was um, at a pastor's conference last week in Portland. Part of what uh, uh, Laura and I were doing, we were attending a pastor's conference and uh, got to listen to some some great speakers. Uh, Bill Johnson was there. Ed Stetzer was there and um, William McDowell was there. And uh, I'll tell you one day a great story about how I met him and made a fool of myself. But we'll save that for another day. But, um, you know, um, we, uh, as we were in that conference, you know, just listening to each one of these different people just share from their, their vantage point of their encounters with God and what they're experiencing and what they're seeing. My, my faith was so stirred to go, you know what, God, each one of them, their story was how they got into the word of God and the word of God got inside of them and they inspired a community of people, each of them radically different people. You know, when, when you look at the, and yet having a major influence on culture and a major influence on the kingdom of God, a major influence on what we see in America. And I just believe that that there's something about when we get into the word of God, that it's so powerful. And I was listening to uh, Ed Stetzer as he was talking and he's like this real brilliant guy. And he was just doing all these statistics. And he was, he was talking about how today culture has, uh, has made this major shift, but the the major shift isn't quite what we think in Christendom. You know, he was talking about most people think there's a great exodus from the church. He's like, but if you run the the numbers from 1930 to 1950 to 1980 to 2019, what you'll realize is that in the U.S., church attendance has actually only ever been at its peak at 23%, and today it's at 19% of Christians 
Christians, people that claim to be Christians that go to church. He's like, where, where there's the huge drop off is actually the other aspect is that culture used to accept Christian values as the norm. So there was a sense that, man, a major amount of people actually went to church. But when you looked at true statistics, you would see not very many people really went to church. That, that even in a society that held to these values, there was only 23%. And now in a culture, a post-Christian culture that we live in in America, where people don't believe in absolutes, they don't believe in, in the principles of the Word of God, they don't believe that this book is truth, church attendance is down a smidge, but what's radically changed is that where the church was once the in-group and everyone wanted to identify with them, the church is now the out-group and no one wants to identify with them except for those that truly go to church. As I look at that, I think about the impact of what happens to us as Christians, as believers, that it tells me that I can go and I can profess something that I never practice. And if I profess something that I never practice, I can get to a place where, where what I profess actually has no value. It has no value because it's not a practice thing in my life. I can say it's important to be in community. I can say it's important to love God. I can say it's important to love others. But if I don't step over the line where I really say, okay, this is something that I'm going to fight for, then I'm going to find myself, much like our society, getting to a place where, where I, I actually have stepped away from what I once professed to believe, what was once a big part of my life. And as I think of this idea of loving people more, I wrote down a few thoughts because this isn't just like, what can we do as a church to like, maybe we can go hand out water bottles. If you want to hand out water bottles, awesome. But that's not what this is about. It's not about doing one more thing. It's not about uh, adding something to, to my schedule and to, to everything that I'm doing, but rather it's, it's about a mindset that says, what, do I, what can I do? to love people more? Like, like, is there something that needs to shift inside of my heart? Because I'm already around people. I'm already all day long, we go to work, all day long we're around our neighbors. What would happen if we just said, God, how can I love people more? And rather than looking for a thing, a mechanism, look to myself and said, where do you already have me, God? Where have you already placed me? What is, the, what is the one person? If we want to reach everyone, we have to start with every one person that God's placed around us. We, we get such a thinking that how can we do something massive? Can, can I challenge you to do something minimal? Can, can I challenge you rather than thinking how can I do this that's going to just hit everybody? Who's the one person that I can go deep with? Who's the one person that I could really change? You know, it's interesting. If every Christian in America led someone to Christ this year, and then all those people led someone to Christ next year, and all those people led someone to Christ the following year, in six point something years, the entire world would be saved. It's really not that hard. The mandate isn't for me to figure out how can I touch millions. The mandate is actually for me to, how can I reach the one that you have for me? Jesus was amongst crowds all the time. And he paused and he impacted the one. What Last week we heard from Pastor Reese, what, what happened when one woman really got impacted by Jesus? She went in and the whole city came back and said, I, I want to find out what's going on because what's taking place in her life is so radical. I wrote these things down that I want to love people more than my wants, more than their failures, more than my desires. I want to love people more than their background. I want to love people more than my pride, than their worth, than my insecurity. You know, this next week we're going to talk about insecurities and we're going to talk about how it's just plaguing us as Christians and how Jesus had an answer for, for that. I, I want to love people more than their tattoos. Come on, uh, for those of you that have tattoos, they're not sinful. It's okay. They're actually, Jesus has some tattoos on his hand. My name is one of them. Um, can I hear an amen? You know, I was in a, I was in a, 
Uber car this last week in Portland, and um, and I had two interesting experiences. And the the second one, I was with this guy, and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm just talking to him for a minute." And uh, and he says, "What do you do?" And I said, "I'm a pastor." He says, "Oh, this is a God thing. Maybe you can help me out." He's like. I've seen some of these these people. They've started to get tattoos after they've become Christians, and uh, and I just can't believe they would do such a sinful thing. What what could I tell them? <laughs> and and I, I started I started to laugh because I'm in the middle of designing some tattoos, and um, and I'm like, well, you could tell them to give me some advice if it looked good. If it looked bad, keep them away from me. But I'm sitting, I'm not knowing how to respond to this guy because he was so religious. And, and I, I said to him, I said, well, how do you think their hearts are? He said, I don't know, but I could see on their arms wickedness. And, and I thought, man. And I said, I said, do you think Jesus had tattoos? And he goes, well, absolutely not. And I said, well, last I checked in my Bible, my name was tattooed into his hand. And he said, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. And I said, well, I do. I'm the theologian in the vehicle, so listen for a minute. <laughs> and, and I said, have you ever, he said, but in the Old Testament, it was a sign of wickedness. I said, that's a lie. It was actually a sign of ownership. I said, if I put the word of God on my body and it says, God loves you, or for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, am I not testifying to my ownership? I do believe there's satanic tattoos. That hear me out. But God cares about our heart, not, not the sleeve on my arm. He doesn't, doesn't care about the shirt you're wearing. He doesn't, that's not the God we serve. And we're not going to love people more if we're looking to the wrong things. So something has to shift inside of us. I'm tell, I say us because I, I'm in the middle of God shifting things in, inside of me because I'm saying, Lord, I want to love people more. And, and, and in my background in business, it's about what program can we do? How can I, how can I get people to, to know if I did this, they would know that? And, and I felt the Holy Spirit just kind of stiff arm me a few months ago. I say, Ponch, to love people more is not about another program. It's about a lifestyle. It's about something going on inside of here. He's like, look at your kids. Do you love them? Like, yes, Lord, I love my kids. He said, well, then how would you express love to them? Would you put on a program? Well, well, no, God, I would just, if I wanted to express greater love to my kids, I would would just be more attentive. I would would put my cell phone away. I, I would... I would, when I'm home, I would be home. When, uh, when we're out, we would be out together. We wouldn't just be in the same car. We would, we would conversate. I would, I would do more. And the Holy Spirit said, now you're getting it, Ponch. Think about this for a minute. The life you live, there's so much opportunity without doing another thing to do more. Are you catching this? Like where we're going with this isn't the next program. It's becoming the new man that I'm called to be in Christ. It's becoming the new woman that God's called you to be. I, I want to I read some scriptures. I want to make a statement. And the, uh, I, I think I'm only going to make it to point one today, but that's cool. The, the, the first thing I wanted to say is that, that Jesus equals perfect theology. And I want to explain something here that as we, as we look to the, the gospels and we look at the life of Jesus, as we look to the life he lived, that's perfect theology which means I can look to Jesus and see how he treats people, and that tells me exact truth of how I'm meant to treat people. I can, I can watch how Jesus responds to accusations and temptations, and I can go, okay, that's perfect theology because Jesus in and of himself, everything he did was theologically perfect. And the, the Bible actually tells us in Hebrews, it says, run your race. Hebrews chapter 12 says, run your race, go after God, do everything he's called you to do, and Fix your eyes on Jesus because there's something about Jesus that changes us. But here's what I want to catch about the life of Jesus as you're reading through the Gospels. I I was going through the Gospel of John and uh, in the Gospel of John, we see that that Jesus begins to look to the Father. He begins to look to the Father. He begins to look to the Father over and over again. Every time he was hit with something, he would talk about how he was modeling what the father showed him, how he was doing what his father said. 
And I just wonder how much of my own life, let alone your life and all of our lives together, how much of it is us doing something out of comparison to other Christians? to doing it out of comparison to other business people, other families. And how much of what I do is truly because I've spent time with the Father and said, I want to be like Him. How much of my response to the the world and the culture around me is just my thinking of what's best and and my interpretation of what's right? And, And how much of it is actually that Ponch has been with his Father and he has some directives? See, I believe there's some big things that we need to go sit down before our Heavenly Father and say, God, we need answers to some of this stuff in our city. We need answers to some of this stuff in our nation. We need need answers to, to, to so many aspects of what we do, but we want your voice to speak to us, Father. We want you to to lead and guide us. And I believe that if if we'll become a people that do that, we're gonna see things radically shift in our life. You want your marriage to go to a whole new level, spend some time with Jesus and say, Father, how do you want me to love my wife? I I know there's some principles and I know I can go get get this and that, but Father, what can I do? Like, would you speak to Poncho about this season? You want to be a better father, a better mother? It's great. Go read a book. Do all those things. But I'm telling you, if you get into this book and get into prayer and say, Father, would you speak to me about in this moment, in this moment, how I can be a better mom, how I can be a better dad? I believe the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I think we as a as a Christian uh, society, uh, or not a, the, the, the church in America, in its Christianity, is is stepping away from pausing and getting a word from God. And instead, we're trying to do more than we probably should and trying to accomplish more than everyone else when really God wants us to take a step back. And I believe He wants us to do significant things. But He wants us to learn to operate by a word a word from him. And when we look at the life of Jesus, he's Luke chapter 11. He's praying. His, his, he's just going for it. And, and the disciples come and they say, Jesus, teach us to pray like this. He didn't go, okay, guys, here's what works. He actually says, if you want to pray like this, there has to be a shift in who you are. You've got to say our Father, not our Lord, not our King, not our master. Jesus could have prayed this prayer any way he wanted, but he wanted to demonstrate the relational value of what the Father's heart is. God wants to have this intimate relationship with us, you guys. And I think that he he just wants to come today. I'm going to have the band come up. I think he wants to come today and just put his hand on your life and remind you I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want you to be my servants. That's not what God's looking for. He doesn't go, man, if I had a few more people serving me, I I could impact this city. I believe God's going, man, if I had a few more sons and daughters that truly knew how to be loved, it would be so lovely the city would be drawn to it. I believe God wants us to get a revelation that he wants to walk with us. He wants to walk with us through the ups and downs. He wants to walk with us through the brokenness. You know, you're not the only one. I'm not speaking to anyone in particular. I'm speaking to everyone in my say this. You're not the only one with an issue. Everyone in this room, we have challenges and we have issues and we have obstacles and we have things where, where we just don't feel like we add up. We don't feel like we match up. But yet God wants to come and he wants to speak to us and he wants to break off all this comparison and he he wants us to just start trusting him and getting to a place where we're actually hungry for his voice. When was the last time that you hungered to hear the voice of God? Like you literally said, God, man, I'm going to keep reading this book till you speak to me. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray longer because I'm so hungry for your voice. I believe our Father is faithful to speak. I believe
believe that he's just calling us out and saying, dreamers, if you want to dream, I, I, need, I need you to get with me. And by the way, I want this more than you do. Like I, I'm standing at the door. I'm just waiting for you to knock. I'm willing to walk with you, whatever your situation is. God's willing to walk with you. 